the well. Well, I will go ahead and kick things off. And I think as latecomers come in, I will be able to let them in. But I do want to thank everybody for being here tonight for another edition of the Big Texas Read, which we've been doing now for over two and a half years with Jim and I, Inc. I'm up in Dallas with uh, Writing Workshops Dallas, and David Samuel Levinson came to us, uh, maybe sent me an email or a text maybe two and a half years ago saying, hey, let's get together with Jim and I, Inc., and let's do a reading series in the big state of Texas. And so here we are two and a half years later. So thank you. Um, this is definitely made possible uh, with a grant through Humanities Texas, which we're very thankful for. Um, and we get lots of support from the University of Texas Library uh, System and the University of Texas San Antonio Library System. Uh, Lone Star uh, Literary as well as a big supporter of the Big Texas Read and uh, the Twig Bookshop in San Antonio, and also in Terrabang Books in Dallas. So really excited for our conversation tonight. I'm gonna send it over to Florinda for, uh, to introduce our special guests. And um, if you can just make sure you're on mute for, for uh, the duration, if you have Q&A, uh, if you have some questions at the end, we'll get to those. But thank you for being here tonight. And uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Florinda. Hey, thank you so much. There was a little glitch right there. Um, so yeah, my name is Florinda Flores Brown and I'm the Director of Programs at Gemini Inc. And if you are not familiar with Gemini Inc, we are San Antonio's Writing Arts Center and our mission is to teach the craft of writing to people of all skill levels, including little ones who, you know, this is, that's part of who this book is for, right? Um, and so they can bring their stories to life. And uh, as Blake said, we have been partnering with Writing Workshops Dallas and with David Samuel Levinson to bring this uh, event to you all. We are so excited to have Carmen Tafoya, Regina Moya, and Dr. Uh, Blandina Cárdenas with us this evening. Um, I will go ahead and introduce them. So let's start with um, Carmen Tafoya. She is named State Poet Laureate of Texas in 2015. Dr. Carmen Tafoya is an award-winning poet and children's author, storyteller, performance artist, motivational speaker, scholar, and university professor. I will also tell you a secret. She's a great dancer. I saw her dancing at a wedding. <laughs> um, the author of more than 30 books and a professor of transformative children's literature at UT San Antonio. She holds a PhD in bilingual education from the University of Texas and a BA, MA, and a doctorate honors, honoris Causa in Humane Letters from Austin College. Tafoya has received numerous distinctions, including the prestigious Americas Award presented to her at the Libra Library of Congress in 2010, first poet laureate of the city of San Antonio 2012 to 2014, five International Latino Book Awards, two Tomas Rivera Book Awards, two ALA Notable Books, the Art of Peace Award, the Texas, the Texas Two by Two Award and Top 10 Books for Babies. Uh, she is the current president of the Texas Institute of Letters. Tafoya is at work on the biography of noted 1930 civil rights organizer, Emma Tenayuca. So uh, thank you, Carmen, for being with us this evening. And then we also have Regina Moya. Regina Moya is a writer and illustrator born in 1978. She has published three novels, Memorias de Dos Mujeres Mexicanas, Donde Anidan Las Palomas, and Turkey Day. Regina has written and illustrated two children's book stories, The Counting Machine, commissioned in 2012 by Deutsche Bank, and The Gift of Water, commissioned in 2013 by Mexican leading nonprofit Galus. They both talk about environmental awareness. The Gift of Water was converted into a short animated film Regina wrote The American Dream, a column in the AEM magazine for seven years. So, and then uh, Blake, you want me to introduce our moderator as well, correct? All right, so our moderator for this evening is Dr. Blandina Cárdenas. For almost 50 years, Dr. Cárdenas, a Del Rio, Texas native, has been a champion for the inclusion, advancement, and success of, of those for whom equity equality, I, I am sorry, of opportunity is not readily available. Her professional roles have ranged from a preschool and high school teacher in Del Rio to an advocate in Austin, Texas for educational innova innovation for migrant children, those with disabilities, Mexican-American college students, and other under-resourced groups. 
to a member of the Carter Mondale campaign staff and eventual commissioner of the Administration for Children, Youth and Families in the Department of Health, Education and Welfare in Washington, DC. From 2004 to 2009, Dr. Cardona served as the first woman to head the University of Texas Pan American, where she focused on technology assisted teaching and learning, increased external funding, the incubation of faculty and student research and the growth of student uh, graduation rates. Today, Dr. Cardenas continues her role mentoring and coaching emerging leaders, especially women in education, entrepreneurship, medicine, law, and public service. So obviously, three incredible women are joining us tonight. Thank you all so much. We look forward to listening to everything you all have to share with us. Well, uh, as moderator, I am delighted to be here. Uh, Carmen and I have uh, our uh, partners in crime and all sorts of good things. And uh, it's wonderful to meet you, Regina, and to uh, know that uh, you're not just an illustrator, you're a very accomplished writer. So let's get on with it and begin by having uh, Carmen and Regina, in whatever order they may wish, uh, share some of the book with us. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna have. Do you want to do the Spanish first, and then I'll do sure, the I can do. I'm that. gonna. I'm gonna have before Regina starts um, with the Spanish. I just want to point out her latest accomplishment because she just came back from Los Angeles, where the International Latino Book Awards selected the last butterfly. Uh, for their silver medal as most inspirational children's picture book. Mm -hmm. And um, and Regina, in addition to the previous two books, which she illustrated, also illustrated this book, which we co-authored. Yes. So, um, okay, so should we read the Spanish also or just the English? Yeah, I think yeah. is that okay. all right? Everybody okay with the Spanish? I uh, Regina is a, is a native of Mexico and, and I am... Uh, very impressed by the the beauty, uh, la elegancia of her Spanish text, and uh, and so I think it'd be nice to start with that. If you don't understand Spanish, I would recommend that you listen to the sound of the language, that you pick up the tones and the emotions, and I think this gives a, a some depth. We'll try it for a while, and if it seems like we're too wordy, then we'll go to just one language instead of okay. Should we show the pictures? Wow. I can, I can show, well, let's see. Okay. I'll show. You can, you can I'll read show the English. picture, okay. and then yeah. you show, you, while you're reading Spanish. Oh, yeah. Okay, good idea. And okay. then, yeah. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. 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 Eras en un universo, un hermoso planeta azul que bailaba alrededor de una estrella. Once upon a universe, there was a beautiful blue planet that danced around a star. Este pequeño planeta azul estaba lleno de vida y de magia y de criaturas maravillosas que sabían escuchar la magia en sus corazones. This tiny blue planet was filled with life and with magic, and with wonderful creatures who listen to the magic in their hearts. Era porque sabían escuchar la magia que los peces sabían cuándo nadar contra las corrientes, las abejas sabían cuándo hacer su miel, y las mariposas monarcas sabían cuándo era el momento preciso de emprender su largo, largo viaje. Because they listened to the magic, fish knew when to swim upstream. Bees knew when to make honey, and the monarch butterflies knew the precise moment in which to start their long, long voyage. Las monarcas no comienzan siendo mariposas. Antes son orugas, orugas como Merliga. Merliga era gordita y se movía lentamente. No tenía alas y no podía volar. Pero dentro de su corazón, ella sabía que estaba destinada a ser una mariposa. La primera mariposa monarca en llegar al santuario ese año. Monarchs don't start as butterflies. First, they're caterpillars. Caterpillars like Merliga. Merliga was chubby and slow and had no wings and couldn't fly. But inside her heart, she knew she was meant to be a butterfly. The first monarch butterfly that year to arrive at the santuario. 
Así que día tras día, durante 12 días, Merliga tejió un capullo alrededor de su cuerpo hasta que quedó completamente envuelta en una resistente punita de seda. Ahí fue donde se transformó y se transformó hasta que su capullo reventó. Ella esparció las alas y voló. So day after day for 12 days, Merliga spun a cocoon around herself until she was entirely covered by her strong silk cradle. There she changed and changed until she burst out of the cocoon, spread her wings and flew. Voló con prisa, mucho antes que todas las demás. Día y noche, semana tras semana, cruzó lagos, montañas, fronteras, cañones, volcanes, atravesando su hermoso planeta azul. She flew quickly, ahead of all the others, day and night, week after week, crossing lakes, mountains, borders, canyons, volcanoes, across a beautiful blue planet. De pronto, reconoció el dulce perfume de los árboles de Oyamel, la magia y el encanto del santuario. Supo que era ahí donde podría al fin descansar sus alas cansadas. Then suddenly she recognized the sweet smell of Oyamel trees, the enchanting magic of the santuario. She knew here she could at last rest her weary wings. Pero algo estaba mal. Este pequeño puñado de árboles ya no era un bosque frondoso. Los cientos de miles de mariposas no podrían reconocer su hogar. Todas se perderían. ¿Sería ella la última mariposa en llegar al santuario? But something was wrong. This tiny clump of trees was no longer a lush forest. The hundreds of thousands of butterflies would not recognize their home. They would all be lost. Would she be the very last butterfly to ever arrive at the santuario? Pero el planeta escuchó su angustia y habló con el viento. Y el viento habló con Manuel. But the planet heard her worry and spoke to the wind, and the wind spoke to Manuel. Manuel era un niño humano que había nacido y crecido cerca del santuario. Él sabía escuchar el viento, sabía hablar con los árboles. Esto es común entre los niños que crecen cerca de las mariposas. Manuel was a human child who had grown up near the santuario. He knew how to listen to the wind. He knew how to speak to the trees. This is common among children raised near butterflies. Cada noviembre había hecho un papalote para dar la bienvenida al fuego naranja y negro de sus alas. Las había observado cubrir el bosque. Había escuchado sus murmullos. Every November he had made a kite to welcome their brilliant fire of orange and black wings. He had watched them fill the forest. He had listened to their whispers. Pero este año, Manuel esperó, esperó y esperó. Sus oídos no escucharon nada. Su corazón no escuchó nada. Sabía que algo no estaba bien. But this year, he waited. He waited and waited and his ears heard nothing. His heart heard nothing. He knew something was wrong. En cuanto salió el sol, Manuel corrió al santuario. ¿Dónde estaban todos los árboles? Se detuvo en un gran espacio vacío donde no quedaban más que hojas y arañas. Una sola mariposa revoloteaba nerviosa sobre el suelo desnudo. As soon as the sun rose, Manuel ran to the santuario. Where were all the trees? He stood in a large cleared area with nothing left but leaves and spiders. He saw only one butterfly flitting nervously above the bare ground. Manuel empezó a llorar. El cielo se entristeció y grandes gotas de lluvia comenzaron a caer. En el murmullo de la lluvia, Manuel escuchó la vocecita suave. Ayúdanos, susurró Merliga. No quiero ser la última mariposa. Manuel started to cry. As his tears dropped, the sky became sad and giant raindrops began to fall. In the whisper of the rain, Manuel heard Merliga's soft voice. You must help, she gasped. I do not want to be the last butterfly. Yo no puedo ayudar en nada, suspiró Manuel. 
solo soy un niño. Todo lo que sé hacer es jugar, soñar y hacer papalotes. Las alas de Merliga comenzaban a marchitarse, pero de pronto una idea mágica se posó en la mente de Manuel. I can't do anything to help, Manuel sighed. I'm only a child. All I know is how to play, how to dream, and how to make kites. Merliga's wings wilted with exhaustion, but suddenly a magic idea flitted into Manuel's mind. Manuel habló con el viento, y el viento habló con el sol. El sol habló con las arañas, y las arañas comenzaron a tejer. Manuel spoke to the wind, and the wind spoke to the sun. The sun spoke to the spiders, and the spiders began to weave. Luego el viento sopló un aliento tan fuerte que las hojas anaranjadas y negras que las arañas habían entretejido se elevaron muy alto al cielo como un papalote gigante. El sol apartó las nubes para que el papalote se viera desde muy lejos. Then the wind blew a breath so hard that the orange and black leaves that the spiders had woven together lifted high into the sky like a giant kite. And the sun cleared away the clouds so that the kite could be seen from miles away. Muy lejos de ahí, las mariposas monarcas débiles y perdidas levantaron la mirada y vieron algo naranja y negro volando. Parecían más mariposas monarcas. Llenas de esperanza cambiaron de dirección y volaron hacia el horizonte. Far away the monarch butterflies, lost and weak, looked up and saw something orange and black in the sky. It looked like monarch butterflies. Full of hope, they changed direction and flew towards the horizon. First, uh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the sun <laughs> has been bailando for us by memory. <laughs> Rebosando de alegría, Merliga leteó hacia lo alto. Un emocionado gracias rebotó de sus alas mientras desaparecía entre millones de monarcas. Muy pronto, las ramas de los árboles de Oyamel se encendieron de colores. Las mariposas habían vuelto. Bursting with joy, Merliga fluttered upwards. An excited gracias dropped from her wings as she disappeared among millions of monarchs. Soon the branches of the Oyamel trees were afire with color. The butterflies were back. Manuel comenzó a pensar y pensar y soñar y pensar un poco más. Pensaría y soñaría porque eso es lo que los humanos saben hacer. Pensaría hasta encontrar una respuesta. No dejaría que el santuario desapareciera. No dejaría a las monarcas sin hogar. Manuel began to think and think and dream and think some more. He would think and dream because that's what humans know how to do. He would think until he found a way. He would not let the santuario disappear. He would not leave the monarchs without a home. La magia siguió susurrando por dentro. Esa magia se llamaba amor. Amor a las mariposas, amor a los árboles, amor a todo aquel hermoso planeta azul que bailaba alrededor de una estrella. Not the end. The magic kept on whispering inside him, and the magic was called love. Love for the butterflies, love for the trees, love for the whole beautiful blue planet that danced around a star. Can you show me the back? Yes. We have some back matter in there mm -hmm. that we thought might be of Go interest ahead, as show. well. Well, here's the actual santuario in Mexico, in Michoacán. And yes, those trees are really green. Uh, the orange is the butterflies. So you get a feeling for how much it is. We have information in the back about butterflies and their migration patterns and um, a little bit of everything. But I mean, then we have two activities at the back so that children can get involved in one of the activities. Well, also in the information about 
monarch butterflies, we tell people some of the things that they can do to help the situation of the monarchs. But in the activities, we talk about their being able to put on a play and to invite people, adults, in positions to change environmental policy and laws to attend, to spread the word so that people vote and demand that our planet be taken care of in ways that keep all of its species alive, including ourselves. And we give some very simple uh, ways that children can, can create these characters without having to, uh, uh, you know, have parents that have their own production company. <laughs> They, uh, you know, little ways in which they can they can create a costume for the wearer or a costume Simple. for the sun. And then uh, also how to build a kite in the very yeah. open right, right. right. So mm -hmm. those are yeah. the, the activities, are the two activities that we listed, at the end. Yes. although we suggest many more for for classrooms. Yeah. Well, what what a treat. Um, to hear it spoken out loud in the two languages, side by side. You know, this may be a children's book, but I don't think you have to be a child to be moved by it. Uh, the magic penetrates even in this 77 year old heart and soul <laughs> and mind. And, and I know that teachers will love it as much as, uh, as the children do. And I think one of the things that you we need to think about always is to encourage parents uh, to read it with their children. Um, I had uh, I told I, I mentioned to you, Carmen, that the day that that you the book you sent me arrived at my home, I was this I was I had a young child visiting me, a young boy about ten years old, who was going through a very terrible time in his family. And the book arrived kind of as a miracle. And I opened it up and the first thing uh, on the page was about magic. And I said to him, his name was not, his name was is Miguel, not Manuel. <laughs> but immediately we started talking about magic and all of the layers of the book and the magic in his body. And I, and he was frowning and I, and I, use the book to make him laugh and to feel the stars inside his body and and we both had a wonderful time and the stars and the magic were inside my body too so <laughs> thank you for that gift it's, it's such so extraordinary so multi-layered and and while we know that certainly adults children of all ages can be enriched by the experience of reading the book and particularly of reading it out loud, I think, because it has been written by two poets. And so the poetry in the language and the sound of the language, particularly in Spanish, I have to say, the murmuro and the santuario and all of that language just coming off the lips is, is so beautiful. Uh, so I'm going to begin by asking, even though we know it's for children of all ages, what particular children did you have in mind as you were writing? What children were in your mind's eye, if you would, as you were writing this book? I, well, I, I, can, I can start with, uh, well, honestly, my own, <laughs> because <laughs> I have three children, so of course, uh, especially and, and and first of all, my own. Um, I mean, I guess when people ask us that question, it, it's a, the answer will always be it, it is for everybody, for children from zero to 100 years old, as we always say. Maybe 110. Maybe 110, <laughs> exactly. But um, you know what? I think that this book um, is very targeted towards migrants and towards people that live around migrants that um, come uh, you know, to settle in different parts of the world because you know, it's happening all over. And this, as you said, this book has so many layers. And I mean, the, butterfly, the monarch butterfly itself is a symbol of migration. Um, so I would say, I mean, honestly, in the bottom of my heart, Yes, of course, to everybody, but 
especially to people that are migrants or that have migrants come to their communities and, um, you know, awaken this sense of hermandad, compassion, and just love, you know? When One of the things that happens when the butterfly crosses lakes and mountains and rivers is she also crosses borders. Yeah. And the borders become like the lakes and the rivers. There's something interesting to see, but they don't stop humanity. It doesn't, the world doesn't transform. The air isn't different. The water isn't different. The emotions aren't different when you cross the border. And I think this is a very important message to give human beings, that, that migration um, is, is something that has always been a part of the human experience. Uh, human beings migrate when when their lives become very difficult where they're at. And sometimes human beings migrate in order to survive. We are facing a time period of climate disasters and um, nobody on this planet is guaranteed that their uh, little corner of the world, no matter how well gated it is or how expensive it is, it is not going to be immune to the effects of climate change and people may have to move. Um, and when you move, you take with you what is most precious, your, your humanity, your sanctity, your dreams, your ability to learn and to grow and to find solutions. So that's what we see this butterfly doing. But there's other metaphors that come in in the book, too, that to me um, make this relevant to readers of all ages. There's one page that really resonates with me so much. I, I can't, um, I, and especially with Regina's beautiful illustrations, I can't take my eyes off the little boy who's standing there squeezing his eyes shut and saying, I can't do anything to help. I'm only a child. And I think how so many of us feel that inside ourselves. I'm only an adult. I'm only a parent, I'm only a worker, I'm only one person. Um, I'm only a, 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 an ordinary citizen. Um, I'm, I'm poor, I, I'm not a high school graduate. All the limitations we put on ourselves, I can't do anything to help. And then he's challenged to go ahead and find ways to help. Um, and there's other, other metaphors that also speak to that, to connect to that, it's a very, um, very smooth connection between the metaphors. Um, even when he finds an answer to the immediate problem of getting those butterflies to the santuario, he knows that you may have found an answer, but you're not done yet. There's more to be done. So Merliga's happy and the butterflies are happy and they're all over the trees, but he sits on top of that little mountain that little hill and he begins to think and think and think to try and find an answer and the thoughts become so colorful and so huge and they're like the whole universe his thoughts spread through the universe um, because he's committed to finding an answer and I think that also uh, resonates with human beings at, at many ages um, most things we care about Taking one of the things that you do really beautifully is that you actually connect him back to the to the elements, to the earth itself, to yes. the sun and to the wind and to the and so the, out of that he then begins by going back to the earth itself. Yes. He finds the ability and the idea and the love to make an impact on that earth through the monarch. So I, think I, like, I like the communications that happen in the book. Communication is not only essential, it's also possible. And people think, well, nobody's going to listen to me and we're not going to be able to talk, but they don't try. Um, and in this book, we see him speaking to and listening to other creatures and other elements. That becomes not only enlightening, but empowering. If you can speak and communicate to someone else or even hear them communicate and understand what they're saying. Um, and it's, a, it's very indigenous in its values in its appreciation of each of the elements, our mother earth, our father sky. Um, he, he speaks to the wind and the wind speaks to the sun and the sun speaks to the spiders and the spiders take some action. And that action helps everybody else. Uh, so in today's world, sometimes we find folks 
who give the message they don't need to communicate with anyone, not even other people of their own species. You know, um, so this is the opposite of that. This is we are going to listen. And there's a saying in Spanish, uh, um, cada criatura tiene voz virtud e idioma. Every creature, and creature in Spanish is more than it is in English. Criatura is, a, is, is something with a spirit of life inside of it. And that spirit of life has a voice. It has its virtue. It has something that it's good for in this world, that it benefits in a positive way and has its language. And if you don't understand the language, then you think you, don't, you can't talk to it. But you can if you listen well enough. So he shows that connectedness, um, it, which reflects the, the indigenous values. Um, and our indigenous nations had no problem understanding why they needed to be water protectors or tree protectors. This has been going on if we look at current events, um, why they refer to the mother as the earth and the sky as the father. These are the, the elements that keep us alive. So they treat their family, their extended family in the universe with love and care. And this is what Manuel is reflecting. He also is taking care of the butterflies, the trees and the whole planet because the okay. magic that's in the planet is the magic that's inside him too. Well, I think it's extraordinary that you have so subtly and so gently brought those indigenous values into, into the story. They're there. Uh, they're there to be explored by teachers. And I, and I, and I, I'm a, I can we have so far to go in bringing our, indigen our indigeneity into the lives, particularly of those those immigrant children who are coming from the areas of all of the santuarios, particularly of Central America and Mexico, et cetera, because there is extraordinary power and value in the learning they bring through their migration to us. So uh, it, it's just a powerful thing. I know uh, uh, Ms. Vialpando uh, was talking about how that connection to the earth and the wind is kind of presented as a life cycle. And, and I think the other metaphor that's extraordinary is the Merluga metaphor uh, as she goes through her stages. Of yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, we, um, when, when we uh, go with the kids and, you know, do these talks, we always use this, uh, this little puppet and at, we loved it because it it's it's amazing. First, it, it starts, has, as, it, a it starts as a cocoon, or no, actually, oh, no, 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 it actually with, starts as a as a oruga, uh -huh. no, as a caterpillar, as a caterpillar, and then and then, it goes and then we and the, and they are so fascinated by this little simple puppet. This was the best Amazon purchase ever. <laughs> I think, uh, then they, I think we had teachers do a run on them because now we're having yes. problems finding it. Oh my That's god, awesome. yeah. And then it. Oh no. Wait, and then the no, same no. little puppet of the cocoon has a second zip. Yeah, it has a and second the kids zipper. Just and then suddenly, this. when we do this. When we do this, all the kids, they, they just like freak out, freak out and they start clapping and yeah, yeah. it's amazing. We, this was the best purchase ever, but <laughs> we, I think that it's so important that we teach kids through uh, art because even this is art, the, the book is art. I, I mean, we can all, I think we can all relate to the best things we have learned uh, in our childhood were not through, you know, the science, um, books or teachings or whatever but through a song or through a movie or through something that somebody did so I think that that's what makes this book so special change is a very difficult concept to explain to children and a lot of times when we're doing our presentations we'll say have you ever changed and they'll go oh no you know and then somebody in the back will say yeah my shoes don't fit me anymore because my feet got bigger. Mm -hmm. And someone else says, I'm not wearing the same clothes that I could wear last summer. And, and they began to realize. And I said, yeah, remember when you were a little bitty baby? Did you see pictures of yourself as a baby? You're not a baby anymore. Oh, no, they're big kids. And so we get to talking about that. But we live in an instant culture. People want things that minute. They think that we're also kind of a superficial culture, that the way things look is the way they are. And Merliga shows us that creatures and dreams 
aren't always at their final point. It, it takes a while to reach your goal. So here she doesn't even have wings and she can barely move along and she transforms. She becomes this very light, uh, beautiful creature with these giant wings. Um, so I think that, that that teaches children a respect for change and for time and a little bit of patience. And I've again got to compliment uh, Regina on the beautiful illustrations because on the page where she does turn into a butterfly, um, <laughs> I look at that and I know it, I'm probably being influenced by my own uh, writing uh, projects, but I look at that and I see an upside down Emma Thanayuka sticking her little fist up in the air. <laughs> um, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, this is who I am and there's her little fist. Mm -hmm. You know, here I am and I'm bursting out of this cocoon. Uh, so it teaches children appreciation for change. And adults also get that. I, you know, I'm chubby and slow and I have no wings and I can't fly, but I know that I can do something that I dream of doing and I know it deep in here. And I think adults find that satisfaction as well in, in reading this. Carmen, I think you and I have a special telepathy because I, what I wanted to tell you was that when I read that Merluga was chubby, and slow. I really identified with that little girl. <laughs> I had that that image identified with this little girl when she was little. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, you know, it's about 740 and we don't have a lot of time left and there's about 12 items on the chat, but I'm just going to go ahead and ask uh, our guests who are with us, to unmute and uh, one at a time. Well, let's see. Let's and and how is it you you do this right? How is it that we do this? Uh, to um, well, they there's a little thing at the bottom where folks could uh, drop their questions in the chat, and we could then unmute them, or they could put the little emoji where they a little reaction where they can mm -hmm. raise their hand if they have a question. Okay, that sounds good. Does anybody have a question? Questions. Or even comments. Let's see, Lolly and Joe's iPhone. Uh, you were talking about powerful messages. What were the powerful messages that you were identifying in this book? Are you still there? Let's see if she wants to come on. I just uh, asked to unmute her. Yes, I'm unmuted. And I'm sorry, I'm in my pajamas, so I'm not visible. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> the the importance of being accepted wherever you land too it is coming through to me and how important the messages of the things that we all bring to the communities we land in is very powerful that's what i'm taking away from that as well wow that is that is very profound yes. thank you Absolutely. Manuel doesn't question, why should I help you? Or you don't come from my village, you come from some other country. He doesn't question that. He immediately goes into action to try and help the butterflies. He's welcoming them every year. Um, but also, I think that the butterfly, now that you mention it, is brings out the best in him. Uh, you know, she's the one that makes him realize that something that's super important for me and i think that one of the most important messages for me is that manuel his solution was to actually build a kite but it was something that he always did it was something that was very familiar to him it wasn't something that was super difficult that was so i think that you know the the metaphor there for me is sometimes the solutions you, are things that you already know. They're not going to be very, very difficult for you. It's not going to be like inventing the, it's just something that you already do. And we uh, repeat it over and over in the book also, porque esto es lo que los humanos saben hacer, because this is what humans know how to do. You, you know how to dream and you know how to think. This is what we do as humans. So you already do it. 
I think one of the messages that I'm always giving in my performances is your best is already inside of you. It's there. You have what you need to become who you're going to become. Yes, you're going to have to figure out a way to get there or to crawl through that window or to, to you know, grab the tools that you need. You have to do something to get there, but it is inside you already. And yeah, building the kite was, I know how to do this. Thinking, he knew how to do that. Dreaming, he knew how to do that. And so he says, this is all I know how to right. do. But he put the thinking, the dreaming, and the kite together to solve the problem now, and then to continue working on the problem to avoid that deforestation from continuing those forests from disappearing. Um, because, you know, people say, why are you so worried about a monarch butterfly? I said, well, you know, if the pollinators disappear, our food source disappears. Do you like to eat anything other than food? You know, I mean, no. So, you know, they have to realize our entire um, ambience, our entire ecosystem is built of all of these species working together and all of these elements working together. And when one of them goes out of balance, everybody else goes out of balance too. Yeah, and something that was very, uh, I mean, sad, powerful also, is that when we started uh, you know, thinking about the book and while we were creating the book, the monarch butterflies were not endangered yet. Yes. They have become yes. very recently yes. endangered just like a month ago or something. Yeah. I mean, declared. We know? got a call. <laughs> I The book I think had just come out. Yeah. We got a call from somebody who had gotten a call from somebody in Idaho that their monarch population, which they'd been tracking, was down to about a fourth of what it had been the previous year. And they found a monarch that had been left behind that, that was probably, you know, they go through several generations on the pilgrimage down to Mexico. And so it was probably born a little late and didn't get a flight with everybody else. And it was, I think, February at that time. And no, no, we were at the other end of things. We were in October, I think. And it was or November. Well, November is November, when it happens. Late yeah. November. Mm -hmm. Most of the butterflies are already out of Idaho in, in early October. And this was like early November. Yes, they and they said, this this butterfly will not make it. This butterfly is going to die. Uh, and one butterfly can make a difference. So they contacted the, the Butterfly Center down here who told them about Cielo Garden in San Antonio. And then uh, the woman at Cielo Garden happened to put something on her Facebook that says, I wish I knew somebody that was going to San Antonio and uh, going was coming from Idaho to San Antonio and somebody else popped in and said, oh, I'm from San Antonio, but I live in Idaho and I'm coming in three days. And she, they contacted the airlines and the airlines helped them. And she carried a little a Tupperware box with uh, ice in it to keep the butterfly sedated long enough to get here. We we're hoping the butterfly wouldn't be dead. I was there when they opened up the envelope mm -hmm. that was on top of the ice box and um, and the butterfly perked up, ate fully, and uh, according to the experts in the in the garden here, would probably be in Mexico within forty eight hours. So um, you know, it was it was simultaneous with this book coming out. We said, "Oh my God, is this going to be the last butterfly?" Yeah, it you can strange. you can just make a storybook about that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me. Uh... Just take a moment. Elva Villalpando Pope has made some wonderful comments, and I wonder if she'd like to share some of her thoughts with us right at the moment. Thank you. I, I'm a teacher, so when you, I saw the puppet, it was like that makes so much meaning to a child. You know, the mm -hmm. visual, the, the 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 things that are you know right in front of them, and they just don't realize it. And as I said in the comment. You know, it takes us as teachers to help them unfold what they are thinking, what they are dreaming about, because they don't realize how valuable they, they really are. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned, you know, we're the ones that help them to get out of that, you know, uh, <laughs> and unfold and, and be able to help them to fly. 
And even the realization that the cocoon phase is very important. Sometimes yeah. you're not ready to fly. Sometimes you're yeah. not ready to go on stage. Sometimes you just need to pull away and think and, and meditate a little while and do some internal growing. And, and this uh, is it's a good metaphor for what you know all of us need to do. Sometimes when we're in a period of change, we need some rest and we need some time and then eventually, when it's the right time, even I, we I'm sorry to interrupt, but even the making of the book was kind of like a metaphor because, uh, well, the idea was here like eight years ago or something like that. And it was just uh, cocooning, I guess. So, so yes. hibernando, I don't know. And then suddenly it, when it was time, it flew. It, uh, yeah. it, it had to come at this time. I think it's more important that kids know about it now. Yeah. No. yeah. Especially now yeah. that they're seeing the butterflies as well, yes. you know, yes. and, and stuff and all in due time, as you mentioned, uh, the timing is very important, you know, mm -hmm. you know, they, they also need time, you know, mm -hmm. students also need time and, you know, and when they have yeah. yeah, yeah. And the and the caterpillar goes and eats and absorbs and grows and adds to herself and then she retreats into the cocoon and then she transforms. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good description of what we do sometimes when we're reading and reading and, and learning and learning and we're just stuffing ourselves with all this nutrition, intellectual and emotional nutrition, which we then need to process and digest and make use of to become the person we know we can become. You know, one of the thoughts that I had as I listened to you talking about the, the cocooning of the book mm -hmm. uh, in your own, uh, how did you two come together? <laughs> how did you decide? How I, you yeah, decide? well, my, I, as Carmen said, I'm original, uh, soy originaria of Mexico City. So, um, well, there's actually three santuarios in Mexico, but the largest one, is one that's very near uh, Valle de Bravo in Michoacán. So one time, uh, a long time ago, like about eight years ago, when I went there and I did, um, we climbed up the mountain with our family and it was just amazing. It was the best day. Um, they told us that it was very cold that day and they told us that the butterflies wouldn't come out if the sun didn't come out. So we were, it was very cloudy that morning. So we were just like hoping and hoping. And suddenly when we got up there with the first ray of sun, it was like magical. All the butterflies were like, whoo, they just started. You could even when you're there, you hear them. It's like a sound. It's like a, and it's all the wings moving. It was amazing. So I came back mesmerized and very worried because of course the guide told us about how each year the pop the butterfly the monarch butterfly population is getting smaller and smaller and you know it, it it has become a huge huge problem so at that time um i met carmen and i told her about i'm like listen i have this I have this need, I have this idea, I just had this experience at the Santuario and I'm coming up with, you know, maybe a story, maybe, maybe a little boy, maybe a this and that. So we came up together uh, with, okay, let's write a story. Let's write a story. It's important. Let's write a story about it. Um, my son's name is Manuel, my older boy. So that was easy. And my grandmother always told us a story where the Elada, the 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 fairy was called Merliga, and I love that name also. And uh, I know there, there's a lot to it, uh, and and that's how we came up with the story back and forth, starting to what do you think about this? What do you think about the boy? There were more characters got, at the beginning. Oh, yes, we had it was a tree. tree. Yeah. Oh, we ate it. To lose we we had to. Yes, to go to a different. We place. had to cut the tree. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. but also you know concepts enter and. and the story grew, it, it, it became more focused and more narrow in some ways so that you could follow the plan of action, but it also grew to connect with the entire universe. So I think it started originally once upon a time 
And I looked at Regina and I said, oh no, this is about a planet. It's gotta be once upon a universe. And so we, we started doing that. So each element becomes a character in the story yeah. and each element is given its respect. And, and the wind and the sun and the spiders. And I have a, a three-year-old granddaughter who, well, she's not three yet. She's, she was two and a half when she got the book and she's about two and almost two and seven eighths now. Um, and she loves butterflies and she loved the book. And every time we get to the spider, she'd go, oh. and I said, oh, but look, they're weaving the kite. And she's, no, no, no. So now she doesn't get quite as scared when she turns to the page on the book of the spider, she goes, Good spider, good spider. <laughs> yeah, you know it. It grew to become the kind of universe that we know is possible, where there is communication, where there is connection, where people are seeking and creatures are seeking to reach their dreams, to reach the magic inside themselves, and to realize that that magic isn't some, you know, far away thing you have to go to a witch or a wizard to find. It, the magic is love, which is absolutely transformative and which impulses people to do things they would have never done. So you just answered what was going to be my final question of our beautiful hour together. Uh, and that is what what is it that you want? The reader that you want, the child that you want, the teacher that you want, the connection to take away from this book. And you've just answered it that that power is within, that that magic is within, that that magic is called love, and that all of us have that magic within us. I want to thank um, all of our guests, and of course, uh, to celebrate uh, this wonderful collaboration uh, between Regina and Carmen. You have truly given a gift to all children, I think you've given a gift to children who don't know that there's magic and in, in children who are not like them. And you've certainly given a gift to children who need to realize that there is magic in them and that that magic is something they can give to the world. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Uh, Blake, I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you so much. That was such a beautiful conversation. And, you know, uh, my kids were kind of listening in the other room before they had to go to bed. They go to a bilingual public school up here in Dallas. And so they're going to really enjoy uh, reading the book, especially in Spanish, because they love that the most. But it was a great conversation. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, all three of you. Thank you. Uh, Florinda, do you have anything? No, just three incredible women. <laughs> Yes. So thank, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. It, was, it was very special to have Dr. Cardenas be our moderator. Yes. And uh, thank really you. Much what an honor. Well, thank you all for being here. Wishing you the best for the rest of the week and the fall to come. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Adios. Adios.